this distinguished lecture. So today we have uh, Professor Swarup Nandan Bora from uh, IIT Kohati. So before he start the proceedings, just a brief introduction to our uh, speaker. So Professor Bora is now a professor uh, of mathematics at IIT Kohati. <coughs> he, oh, where he has been working since uh, January 1999 after completing schooling from Balian Bhavan, Johar, then pre-university and BSc from Cotton College. Then he completed his MSc from Delhi University and PhD from Delhousie University, Halifax, Canada. He is an internationally acclaimed researcher in coastal and ocean engineering and differential equations. Professor Vora's other interest research areas are river mechanics, integral transforms, and integral equations. To his credit, he published 85 research articles in reputed journals and guided more, uh, more than 40 PhD thesis, examined 40 uh, PhD theses and guided uh, around uh, 10 uh, PhD scholars. His main areas of teachings are differential equations, integral equations, numerical analysis, fluid dynamics, water wave mechanics, and calculus. <coughs> and uh, recently, he has been elected as the president of the leading research organization, Indian Society of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics, ISTAM, for 2022. And a little bit of off the academic record, he is coming from a very humble background. He is the youngest son of the late Padmasri Lakshmi Nandan Bhur. So now it's up to you, sir. Please. Uh... <clears throat> yeah, so thank you so much, Topan, for the introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here today. So as uh, Professor Kandan mentioned that uh, the invitation was sent long back, yes, uh, Professor Diuch, I think, had sent me the invitation initially. And I, I did not say no or I did not say yes, but because at that time I was not in a position to say anything. But I said, of course, in principle, I agree. Then uh, in consultation with Topon, uh, and this date was uh, decided. And I'm here before you uh, to present uh, a lecture uh, uh, Topan, please confirm you are seeing my slide or not. Yes, yes, it is visible. Yeah. So I'm just trying to make it uh, full screen. Okay, so uh, uh, when I wanted to, uh, when I decided to give a lecture here and when I discussed with Topon, and I always felt that when there it is a lecture series, uh, I'd be expecting a heterogeneous uh, audience so it is probably not proper for more more i mean for me to directly go to the research because anyway i think uh, srm uh, two weeks back i had delivered a lecture in srm ist so exactly two weeks after i am with the younger brother of srm ist speaking here so i felt that i just uh, tell something which i know and it's not that you do not know and my first introduction to Osen was actually in Andhra Pradesh uh, because my father was doing his PhD in meteorology in Andhra University. So I had spent one month in Waltayar and that is the first time actually I saw Bay of Bengal. And I am also uh, sure probably your institute, I don't know the exact location. It may be roughly about 100 meters off Bay of Bengal if I'm correct. Right, is it Topan? Uh, this one, this uh, um, SRM University, sir? Uh, from the oh, sea. Seashore. Uh, I exactly don't know the distance, but uh, yeah. yes, the, we are near roughly, the... roughly about 100. Yeah. 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 When you see an ocean for the first time as a child, I was very excited. I used to run the guest house was facing Bay of Bengal of Andhra University. Every morning, we, after getting up, straight away, I'll run to the beach, and my parents had to run after me. And at that time, hardly I knew that later on I would be working in a research area which will be involving OSEN. So that is my first introduction to OSEN and definitely I have seen many countries and I have visited many parts of India and I have seen Arabian Sea, Indian OSEN, Bay of Bengal, Pacific, Atlantic. 
and I hope to go sometimes to Arctic Ocean because there are certain works I am doing by sitting from Guwahati by modeling some problems, actually, whatever is happening in Arctic Ocean. Now, all of us know very well about waves. Now we know there are different types of waves. So water wave is one of them. And since I have been working in water waves for a long time, I always think that it's a very easy subject, but it is very fascinating. Now, why I studied wave propagation or why I think that it is very important. So definitely, I mean, we know when we talk about ocean, if you look at our art or we say about world, all of us know we had studied in geography that most of the part is covered by ocean. But still, since we stay on land, we sometimes do not feel that we probably need to know so many things about ocean. But yes, if the larger part of the art is covered with ocean, so definitely it commands attention from all of us, whether from the point of view of having some general knowledge or you want to add research into it. So when you look at all the oceans or the components, which we call a sea, so there were so many fascinating things happening. What we know, how much we know, I think we don't know much. If you recall uh, the famous quote of Laplace, what he had said, what we know is very, I mean, little, but what we know, uh, what we know is not much and what we do not know is enormous. And that actually applies to two things, I'll say, uh, from my point of view, one is space and another is ocean. How much we know about ocean? We know certain type places that there is a depth of 10 kilometers, we call this the deepest point on earth, which is Mariana's Trench. But have we been able to successful to locate the um, uh, Malaysian Airlines aircraft, which lost its way and got disappeared? Till now, I think it's almost eight years or nine years. We do not know actually where the aircraft has vanished. So that shows our limitation. We say we, have, we are advanced now, a lot of science and technology we have done. But in that sense, we are nothing. We have not been able to actually stand to what oceans have. Now, we know even the amount of water that we talk about, we use fresh water. We use river water from river, from pond, from lakes, mainly uh, inland. But if you look at the amount of water, actually, almost 98% of our water is actually from ocean only and associated sea ice. Why it is that? Because you know, when you go towards north or you go to extreme towards south, instead of water, most of the time, actually, you may come across sea ice. Now you have seen the map or you know about the flat map that I just showed, coastline. Coastline is very important, not only from our point of view of geography, but it is point of view of many things about you talk about economy. So many millions of people are actually dependent on activities that is carried out in ocean. We talk about some transportation of crude oil from Saudi Arabia to India unless you decide to have a pipeline directly, you would only other alternative way to transport the crude oil will be through big vessels, which will have big containers, which will actually carry crude oil to us. Now coastlines actually change time to time. So it is not a, I mean, fixed uh, measurement that has been done, but whatever you look at, what you can say that due to certain uh, events or certain incidents, the coastline may change. And as you know, Canada is a very big country. On one side, it has um, Atlantic Ocean. On the other side, it has Pacific Ocean. On north, actually, if you see, Canada is very expansive on north, uh, which actually has uh, Arctic Ocean there. And if you talk about uh, uh, India, of course, Assam is a landlocked state. Uh, it's very far from me to go to Bay of Bengal if I want to see it through my eyes, uh, but I can work uh, for oceans just by sitting at IIT Guwahati in my office. So it has, uh, India has a land frontier of 15,000, more than 15,000, and it has coastline, 7, 000, more than 7,500, starting from, the, from Gujarat, then Maharashtra, Goa, Karnataka, Kerala, then you take a turn, Tamil Nadu, 
Puducherry, Andhra Pradesh, and Odisha and West Bengal. And we also have our islands or group of islands like Andaman and Dikubor and Lakshadweep. So that means India also actually, we have a large coastline and there are many activities that take place along the coastline. So it is not only that activities take along the close, uh, take up, uh, take place along the coastlines, but there are many offshore structures. So uh, I'm not sure, but I heard that maybe in Andhra Pradesh also, there is some ONGC research uh, extraction is going on, maybe near Rajamundri or uh, um, somewhere near the sea in Bay of Bengal. And we already know that in Bombay High, we have oil extraction uh, from ocean bed. So these are certain offshore structures. And if you add to that, we know about big vessels or ships or boats moving. So these are also actually moving in ocean waters. Now, if you, why we want to study uh, water waves? Uh, for us, even if we do not study water waves, I can still get uh, rice and dal for my lunch. I can get chapati for my dinner. Why I need to study water waves? Why I need to do that? Now, I am driving my car. I know India is not independent of petroleum. So maybe the car that I am driving, the petrol I'm maybe getting from Saudi Arabia or Iran or somewhere like that. So how my petrol is coming or if the petrol that you are using is coming from, it is definitely uh, from those countries through some vessels which are actually traveling through ocean. So there are many structures that are present, maybe floating. Sometimes it is uh, immersed totally or sometimes it may be partially. Most of the time it is a partial immersion. You talk about totally total immersion. You can talk about uh, submarines. Okay, so submarines, we always think that it is used for wars. That is true, but it is also used for many other scientific activities. And we can have any uh, many other structures that may be floating. Now, when a wave propagates, it comes and hits an obstacle. The obstacle may be offshore or the obstacle may be just the shoreline. Now wave gets scattered. There may be a structure which is in motion. It may be a ship which is uh, moving from one country to another country, or it may be certain structure which is actually oscillating. That is, it is having a small motion. And there are certain cases that wave gets trapped. We, talk, we told them as trapped waves. It occurs around some structure. Okay. So we know about uh, trapping of waves or even the best example is when you consider wave equation, one dimensional wave equation when we teach the students. So we talk about the vibration in an infinite string and a vibration in a finite string. So when we uh, talk about the vibration that happens in an infinite string, that is a progressive wave. But if you are trying to play some instrument, say I'm trying to um, so my expertise on playing a guitar. So that is also how I am getting the melody or what, how I am getting the sound out. It is nothing but movement of the strings. I am pulling the string, making a displacement to the string, and through that I am getting a sound or uh, I am getting a very beautiful uh, sound only. I will say it's coming out. Now for guitar, what happens? The wave can move from one point of the string to the other point of the string and just move from this point to that point again and again. So in that case, wave cannot go out of the boundary of the string. That is, if the string is of length L, it cannot go out of X equal to zero and X equal to L. So that we can say that that is the example of a standing wave. Now, when we talk about uh, uh, fluid flow, we have to uh, see actually how we talk about the flow over a variable bottom. So though mathematically, it is always easier for us to consider a horizontal bottom, but we know that in practical sense, uh, we always face an unevenness on the ocean bed, or if you are talking about a river, we cannot say that river bed is flat. Now, there are structures, suppose on the shoreline, like you have a port, you have a dock, you want to save it from the fury of the wave. You know water wave is very strong. And at times it is not like uniform throughout the year. At times, depending on the weather and depending on the time actually, it may be very furious. Then how you protect those installations? 
And there may be certain offshore insulations also, how we protect them. So you may have to design something which protect those structures. And nowadays we see land, uh, certain countries which are very small, they're finding it very difficult. You take, for example, Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, etc., which are very small countries. You add to their Netherlands, Belgium, etc. Now, not only they are trying to expand their activities or say even for population, they are trying to actually um, construct uh, certain uh, structures on the ocean itself. And uh, Netherlands uh, and uh, certain other countries uh, near North Sea, they are also what they are trying to do because they generate uh, wind energy. They're trying to install the windmills in ocean because compared to their own land, actually ocean has a lot of vacancy, right? So now what are the methods? You cannot simply go and put uh, or insert a structure or install a structure in ocean. So definitely you have to do some scientific study so that this structure can remain there and it can actually serve the purpose, okay? So now, now looking at ocean, from our eyes, all four are very beautiful pictures. If I am a surfer, I will like the first picture. And if I like adventure, maybe I have gone into the sea and some storm comes, I will love this. But if I consider myself as Sorup Nandan Bora, who is trying to solve some physical problem by using mathematics, I will prefer these two pictures. Because if you compare, you can see the nonlinearity which is inherent in the top two pictures, but you can say that these two um, lower pictures actually represent the linearized free surface, which you know that in mathematics, as far as possible, given a linear problem under satisfaction of certain conditions, we like to linearize the problem or we like to create a situation which we call as idealization, okay? So if I go with my family, I'll prefer first two pictures. If I go alone, I want to look for some of my problems, I look at the third and fourth pictures. So in a, as you know, this is a picture from South Sinai Sea, but similar structure also, uh, exists in Bombay High and probably also ONGC has started that in Bay of Bengal as well. On the right side, it is a picture from the uh, sea near Taiwan. Taiwan, you know, it's a very small country. I don't know I can call this as a country or not, but I think it's a country because when I went to Taiwan, I had Taiwanese visa, not the mainland China visa. So Taiwan being a small country, they have certain activities they wanted to shift to ocean. And these are the countries, you know, I mean, they eat a lot of fish. So now what they have shifted, that fishery business, okay, or the production of fish from the mainland by saving uh, the, I mean, the precious land, we'll say, because smaller the country, then uh, more precious is the land. They have started fish culture actually in nearby sea. You can see this person actually doing something here. So these are certain structures which are in ocean, but we know that they have to withstand the fury of ocean, ocean waves. Not only that, they also have to, we, uh, I mean, mathematically or uh, from engineering practice, you have to see how you can make the wave dissipate, okay? You want the wave to be absorbed by the structure so that not much damage is done. Similar way for certain other activities, if you look at the picture on the left, the, this is a makeshift airport, which is called as floating airport, which is used by many countries for actually defense purpose. Because you know, in Pacific Ocean, if you see, there is a vast area actually without any land. Now, if you want to uh, make your aircraft land or you want to uh, make your aircraft uh, take off, you need some structure which is a very small structure, but it has to actually withstand or counter the wave attacks. This is another st uh, structure on the right. This is called a buoy. So nowadays, you know, we are for non-conventional energy. Okay. So, 
So we cannot uh, depend on uh, petroleum or coal all the time, the natural resources. So where is, I mean, ocean is a vast area. So now we know ocean waves have enormous energy. So now how to tap that energy and you convert to electrical or mechanical energy for use of mankind. So I do not know exactly how energy is that, but I know about structures which are called wave energy converters, which are actually installed in ocean water. Now these are the structure that I'm talking about, more or less that they are stable, or you can say they are at rest. Some kind of oscillation or some small displacement happen. So that will be small motion. But you consider a big ship, not, no, not necessarily a big ship. It can be a small ship. It can be a fisherman's ship, which is used extensively by the coastal areas in India or elsewhere as well. Now, in addition to the wave that is hitting the structure, the ship or the vessel itself is creating another wave due to its motion, which is called as a radiated wave. Now you have to take all into account how the ship has to move, what direction it has to take. That's a different issue. Accidents happen, but accidents happen means it is not that we did not know what we had to do, but at instant what happens, you do not know. You take the example of the sinking of uh, the great Titanic. It was not due to some fault of the uh, ship or something like that, but it is due to that they could not observe a big iceberg which was moving actually and Titanic hit the iceberg and it sank in ocean, right? It is more than 100 years back, maybe 1912 it was. Then and there is another matter of concern in ocean seas. It is called oil spin. Recently I read somewhere that uh, some vessels actually due to some malfunctioning, they spill some oil. So we do not know much, but you still know that there are a lot of flora and fauna in ocean. So how we save that? We have to, I mean, uh, control the pollution. Pollution, it may be intentional, it may be unintentional. Most of the oil spills are unintentional. It is something like accident. Now, once the spill happens, you try to save the ecology by uh, doing some modeling, which will actually stop the spread of the spoil. There are certain countries which call them as advanced countries, but they have the bad habit of dumping wastes in the ocean. Unless there is a proper monitoring by a nearby country, there's a possibility that ocean water may get polluted. Okay, now let's come to waves. So I just uh, wanted to mention certain uh, things that are related to wave propagation. So now when I talk about waves, so this is a typical uh, picture, means a standard water wave. So when we talk about a wave that we know that the maximum displacement up in the upward direction, the point we call as crest and the lowest point we call as trough and the distance between two consecutive uh, um, crests, we call this as a wavelength. Now you see, it is like a standard wave. I'm saying standard wave means it's like a sine curve or it's like a cosine curve, okay? Now, if you look at the displacement, upward direction and downward direction, then you can say that this is the mean free surface, okay? Mean free surface means we can consider that it is like say Z equal to zero kind of thing instead of moving. So highest displacement, is called amplitude, but instantaneous displacement is this. At every instant, there will be some displacement, right? So there are certain notations uh, which are used in uh, water waves. One is called wave number, which is the ratio of two pi to uh, the wavelength. T is the time period, a wave has the time period. Then we also have the notation called the angular wave frequency, which is denoted by sigma or omega. And crest and trough, we already know. Then I was talking about instantaneous wave uh, elevation, mean instantaneous displacement of water uh, that is uh, denoted by eta. And A we call as the amplitude. Okay. Then in water wave mechanics, uh, the most important quantity uh, or entity that we use is called velocity potential, which is usually dependent on space coordinates as well as time. But by considering a time harmonic motion, you can convert that potential 
to a potential which depends only on the space coordinates. Now we know about water waves, it is kind of a swell. Uh, we don't need to be a scientist or we don't need to be an academician to know what is a wave or uh, what it means. And there are motions actually involved with wave. That is what we call as uh, wave uh, propagation. And there may be certain oscillations. There may be some kind of undulations. And there are many other uh, aspects of it depending on the wavelength or uh, the wave number, etc. Okay. And as I was talking about, we can talk about uh, progressive wave and we can talk about standing wave that I have briefly discussed already. But most of the time we are concerned with the progressive wave because most of the water wave mechanics problem, we uh, assume the wave to uh, start moving from the direction of minus infinity and go towards plus infinity. And for certain cases, we'd like to discuss the wave in a finite region where, where we may actually also have in addition to scattering some kind of trapping of waves. Now, what concerns the wave motion? So basically there are two physical mechanisms that control and maintain wave motion. One is gravity and another one is surface tension. So for most of the waves uh, that we actually encounter, gravity is the restoring uh, <coughs> force that will cause any displacement of the surface and it will be accelerated back to the mean surface level. That is the work of gravity. And that's why many times uh, the was mm -hmm. wave actually we consider they're also known as <coughs> surface gravity waves. Is now again, you? yes. yes. Yeah, there is a question on the chat box. Uh, I think oh. I will answer the questions only after I finish. Yes, yes. So the, after the talk, we will take all the questions. Hey, can you tell the question? Uh, I question is, uh, can you tell something about Bermuda Triangle? <laughs> I am not that expert enough. The Bermuda Triangle is a totally, I mean, uh, different entity. Uh, I think still that is not solved. That's what it's called the mystery of Bermuda Triangle. So uh, it is not about the wave that is at the surface. So something must be there, uh, which is at the depth of this. So it also may have to do with some different kind of force that may be acting there, okay? So other than that, I think I am not uh, qualified enough to make any other comment. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, whether the wave is short or wave is long, actually, accordingly, the, we have to discuss uh, the wave propagation. So there are some very crude definition of a short uh, wave or a long wave. Okay, that's a crude definition I'm seeing. It is not very uh, fixed kind of thing, right? So if you say the wavelength is less than a very few millimeters, millimeter itself is so small, then we are saying that less than a very few millimeters, then actually surface tension comes into picture. But in ocean wave, most of the cases, and it has been proved, I also have some papers, that surface tension actually does not play a very great role because we are talking about uh, the wave propagation in a very big region where most of the time, waves are found to be long waves. Now surface gravity waves, when we talk about, uh, in that case, actually gravity is the dominant force. It will have wavelengths greater approximately. Again, it is approximate. It's a crude definition of 10 centimeter, okay? So, but if you have some intermediate range, both of them may work, okay? Because you have categorized. So intermediate, what will happen? It may go towards surface tension or it may go towards Gravity being the control mechanism. But when we talk about uh, mathematical theory, we want to talk about mathematical modeling of the problem. We have to come down a little bit. We cannot just go ahead with whatever is happening in ocean. You ask me why, uh, how we model a tsunami. Two or three weeks back, the tsunami that happened in Tonga or the tsunami that happened in 2004, which actually what had a devastating factor, not only in Japan, other countries in Asia like Taiwan, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, India, Thailand, and it even touched the, the Eastern coast of Africa, right? But when we talk about uh, applying mathematical theory uh, to uh, water wave propagation, we would like to see that there are certain theory 
where we assume that we are looking for waves whose amplitude is small compared to their length. Okay, the wavelength compared to the wavelength, amplitude is small. So in other words, what we are talking about, we are talking about a small displacement of the wave. And usually that can be, I mean, characterized by some sinusoidal wave and there will be definite relationship between the wavelength and the wave period. Now, longer waves will travel faster than shorter ones, which is called dispersion. That is what you see, tsunami was created near Japan and the waves had the intensity to go and hit the coast of Africa at the farthest point. So there are certain definitions of the long gravity waves. So if it, the water depth is the less than 120th of wavelength, then we call them as long wave. And in deep water, deeper the water, faster the waves travel. Capillary wave, you know, I just defined capillary wave, which is a very wave corresponding to very short wave. Shorter wavelengths uh, travel faster than longer ones. Now we come to uh, taking up problems. So there are two theories available. One is a linear theory. Another one is a nonlinear theory. Nonlinear theory, you can say that it is the problem the way it comes before us. Linear theory will be given a nonlinear problem, whether it is possible for us to convert it to a linearized problem so that we can use the theory relevant to that. You know about linearization and non, non linearization of a nonlinear problem. The best example is the equation of motion of the bob of a pendulum, which naturally arises as a nonlinear equation. But under the assumption that the displacement is small, we linearize the differential equation. Now, unfortunately enough, when we talk about a boundary value problem or initial value problem, we have a governing equation. And here it is governing equation is Laplace's equation in most cases. And in certain cases, if you consider the potential, phi I had defined it to be potential, what happens there is that if it is the number of independent variables is more, it becomes difficult for us. Now we study, since there are three directions, whether there exists a direction along which the activity is less. Now, suppose for this three dimensional problem, I find that most of the activities are taking place in forward direction, that is X, and downward direction, which is Z. We have another horizontal direction, Y, along which there is not much activity. Then we can convert that three dimensional Laplace's equation by assuming that the Y component is the, has, represents a periodic function, which becomes a two dimensional equation, which is known as modified. Helmholtz equation. Now, what is that phi? How it has come here, velocity potential? So whenever we talk about a fluid flow, we know that whenever we talk about a flow, we talk about a motion, we talk about velocity. Now, potential function is a scalar function, which is connected to the velocity of a fluid particle by the relation, I should have written that relation here, if Q is the velocity, Q will be equal to minus gradient of phi. That relation, through that uh, relation actually, phi is called the velocity potential. And we know what is the velocity potential or we talk about the potential. Anything that flows actually will uh, flow from the higher potential to the lower potential. Now, since it is time, if we consider it to be a time harmonic motion, we can take the time component out so that our capital phi, which is a function of x, y, z, or it may be any other coordinate, depending on what coordinate system we are considering, and t, and if we consider it to be time harmonic, ultimately you see that capital phi is unknown, but here you'll see that small phi is only, remains only as the unknown one. So there are many assumptions we make. We may call it as an idealization, or you can say that it is for convenience. But when you make assumptions, we cannot go too far away from the reality. When you make some assumption, it must have been proved or it must have been shown by others earlier that this is possible. Since we are talking about the fluid to be water, it is incompressible and inviscid. That is, viscosity is not a major factor there, very negligible one. And unless you consider the fluid layer to consist of strata or it's a stratified fluid, it will be homogeneous fluid so that actually there is no variation of the 
density of the fluid. And you talk about actually uh, rotational motion or irrotational motion, water wave mechanics, uh, most of the problems can be solved by assuming the motion to be irrotational. Even after making these assumptions, if I insist to use linear water wave theory, there may be certain questions. Why not nonlinear theory, but you are going to use linear theory? Because looking at the picture itself, even a five-year-old boy, you can say, if he knows what is linear, what is nonlinear, that this is not a straight line or this is not a plan. This is basically nonlinear in nature. But for most of the engineering applications, experiments uh, have been done and it has been found that if you are finding a solution by using linear water wave theory instead of nonlinear water wave theory, still you get a solution which is not very far from the solution that we would have obtained by using nonlinear theory. Therefore, the problems I'm saying, but you can say most of the problems, basically 90% of the problems in water mechanics can be modeled by using small amplitude wave theory or linear water wave theory. So you need certain boundary conditions. I'll move a little faster here. You need uh, boundary conditions because we are going to form a boundary value problem at different surfaces that will be available, free surface, body surface, ocean bottom, etc. Then you may also need some matching conditions which may be required because you are talking about the continuity of pressure and velocity. So you may have to match the conditions at the boundary, which we call as interface. So now you talk about the boundary or border of two countries. So you can say the border belongs to both countries or the border does not belong to both countries. But you know one thing, whatever happens must be common to both the countries. So similar way, you have an interface. You can say whatever is in the upper layer, whatever is in the lower layer, that characteristic must be satisfied along the interface. So there are uh, important conditions to be satisfied on the free surface. One is called kinematic boundary condition. Another one is called dynamic boundary condition. And here you can see these are nonlinear terms. If I am using linear terms, then actually my equation, uh, this is the linearized condition of this. And if I combine actually both the conditions, I will get an equation like this which is a standard, uh, omega is the angular wave frequency, z is the acceleration due to gravity, and you can see del phi del z. So that is basically nothing but your velocity component along the z direction. Now, bed may be um, a flat bed, or it may be a function of two variables. In that case, impermeable bed condition means it's like a no slip condition. There is no motion beyond this surface, that is the, your bottom surface. Then since uh, ocean waves are dispersive, there is a standard dispersion relation uh, due to these uh, considerations, which are given by this. And from this case wave number, by solving this actually, you can get the values of the wave numbers, which may be real, may be complex, or may be purely imaginary. Now there is something called deep water, shallow water. It is not related to depth alone. It is basically the ratio of the depth and the uh, wavelength. Tsunami occurs due to some disturbance at the ocean bed. So we think it's a deep water wave. No, because when tsunami is created, the wavelength is so much that compared to the depth, actually wavelength is too big. So that is actually a shallow water. <coughs> wave. And then we can have different fluid layers. We can have different surfaces. And sea beds may have different characteristics. For easy modeling, we can take this to be an impermeable uh, bed. Or we, uh, if we go to be towards more realistic point of view, you can consider the bed to be porous. You may take into account also the elasticity that is possessed by the ocean bed. And you can combine both porosity and elasticity, which will be known as the poroelastic seabed. Upper surfaces, if it is free, it is free surface. Thin ice sheet, you go to Arctic Ocean, you go towards Antarctica, you will always see, if not every, all the time of the year, at least seven or eight months of the year, it will be covered with some thin ice sheet. So that is the upper surface. Rigid lip, there may be certain structures which is uh, on the uh, 
free surface or virtually also you can introduce a rigid lead because that makes your problem much easier. That is called a rigid lead approximation and the solution that you obtain is more or less same as when you consider a free surface condition. You can insert different kinds of structures. It may be a thin vertical barrier. You may have cylinders. You may have an array of cylinders. You can have different kinds of blocks. You can have spherical structure, etc., or any number of such structures accordingly, uh, according to what actually installation you have, uh, you want to incorporate in the ocean bed. The most important aspect is scattering. A wave is, in, a wave is incident on a structure, it gets disturbed. If it is a rigid structure, it will get reflected and some part will get transmitted around the structure. If it is a porous structure, it will get reflected, but certain part will actually impinge through the porous structure and certain part will get transmission. So reflection and transmission are very important uh, aspects when we talk about a wave mechanics problem, which happens due to scattering. And you can also find the hydrogen forces that will be acting on that. Radiation. Radiation, I will not spend much time. Radiation will be if you are talking about a structure, scattering is basically you assume the structure to be at rest, then whatever is happening to the wave that is scattering. But when the structure moves, it is not that it is moving at some uh, 20 kilometer per hour or something like that. It may, may be some kind of displacement. That is also, we call this as a motion. It is some kind of oscillation. That is what your radiation is. So there are actually six types of motion. We usually see that uh, ship is moving. So we just look at the X direction. It is moving in this direction, but there may be some displacement of the ship along Y direction, and it may be moving like this, right? So these are three translational motion named as SARS event sway along the um, vertical axis, mutually perpendicular axis. And there are three more motions which are called rotational motions, which are called roll, pitch, and yaw. So if this is a structure, this is your X direction, Y direction, Z direction. So when this structure moves in waves, so this is the SARS motion. This is the main motion that we say, but there will be something in upward and uh, downward direction, some kind of displacement that is due to this hip motion. There may be some other motion along the other horizontal direction that is called sway and along or about all the axis, there will be three motions which are called roll, pitch and yaw. So in general, we are, you are supposed to consider all these six motions. But for most of the practical problems, considering only two translational motion, that is SARS and HIV, and one rotational motion, that is roll, will give you a proper modeling for a problem uh, which considers some structure in motion. So I think I have to uh, jump a little bit. So there are two important quantities when we talk about radiation. One is called added mass. Another one is called damping coefficient. So phi rj is the radiated potential and this is the radiated force. So you can see when you talk about this force and you equate the real and imaginary part, the quantity that you get uh, the real part that is called added mass and another part that is called damping coefficient, which can be. So what is any physical sense? What is an added mass? It is basically the weight you can consider that gets added uh, to a system in a fluid because of the motion, okay? And damping, we always know, whenever there is a motion, there is a resistance. So that is what damping is. Now, how important added mass and damping are uh, with respect to some motion in ocean is that almost all bodies, which is accelerating means, which is in motion in a fluid will be affected by added mass, but there are certain cases where actually added mass becomes more important, which depends on the density of the fluid, as well as the density or weight of the structure or vessel, whatever is moving. Many a times added mass can be even greater than the mass of the body. So when actually you talk about ships, submarines, or many offshore platforms, which will be in oscillation, for ships actually certain times added mass may be three, four times the mass actually in hip mode. Hip means this vertical motion or it may be 
one or one point five or two times when it is in surge motion. And damping, of course, we know about know about um, the resistance that is faced by uh, this trapping. As I have said, trapping is also another interesting aspect where we know actually. Because when we look at the wave, all waves look like progressive, but we do not know actually underneath the free surface, there may be some region for a structure where the wave may get trapped. So a proper study is required to see actually whether there exists a trapped wave, wave for a specific problem. Surface tension when you have discussed. Porosity is the, now dissipation I have been talking about. You want to dissipate the wave. You want to uh, reduce the intensity of the wave. You want to protect a structure from the wave. The best way is that you introduce some porous structure, which will help you actually in uh, reducing the wave force. So there are certain structures you see here. These are kind of your uh, docks, okay? Now these are the areas near dock. What are these structures that have been built? It is just to see that the wave comes and hits these structures first so that the areas you see here, they remain quiet or what we call as a tranquility zone so that you can anchor your ships, you can do the loading and unloading. But to know that we have to ascertain many things. Then there is another example. This is one work that I will briefly discuss. So you can see a structure here. So this structure is actually nothing, but this is the base of an windmill, which is being inserted in ocean. You see another structure here, small, small things, these are fish. So there is some fish farm along this structure. This is the figure that I had shown already here. So what is being done here is that you want to uh, construct a windmill surrounded by another area where you are doing your physiculture, fishery, but how to construct this uh, cylindrical or circular wall? What are the properties that it should possess? So this is basically the structure I'm talking about. Now, if you want to install a structure, you want that this should not be get affected uh, by the impact of wave. So you have to do some mathematical modeling. I'll go very quickly. So that problem itself, we want to do it mathematically. My diagram becomes this. Inside one, there is a rigid cylinder, which is the base of the uh, windmill. Now, surrounding it, I have a thin porous wall, circular wall. So what is the objective? Wave comes and cannot hit this directly. It will hit this porous structure. Wave gets absorbed so that the wave afterwards hits this structure with less intensity. So we can say we are trying to protect it. Now, what is uh, our objective? We have to design it in such a way that we have to know what should be the radius of this cylinder, what should be the radius of this area, and what should be the optimal porosity that should be given to the structure that we know that the wave is getting dissipated or we will getting damped. Mathematically, it is not a very difficult uh, uh, proposition. As I said, Laplace's equation, which is nothing but actually your equation of continuity for this kind of flows will be satisfied, but you have two regions here, you see. Region one, outside. Region two is this area. Okay. Then you have certain conditions uh, satisfied at the free surface and also satisfied at the ocean bed. Then you will be solving for phi one and phi two. So you have some kind of thin structure. So at the wall of the porous cylinder, you have a condition like this, where Z1 depicts the porosity of the porous structure that you are considering. Having done that, what you will do, you will find the potentials, phi one and phi two. So this represents the Z function, cos hyperbolic or cosine function. UM, that will be actually some kind of Bessel function, maybe first kind, second kind, or Henkel function like this. These are UM, Henkel function of first kind and modified Bessel function of second kind. So 
similar so what you will do you will find a potential so one you know that once you find a potential you are in a position to evaluate the force which will be acting at the surface of the inner cylinder and the outer cylinder so this is what the so this is the force acting at r equal to a that is the inner cylinder this is the force acting at the outer cylinder which is at r equal to b then after doing that what you will do you will try to analyze if you give different values of the radius if you want to give different porosity values in what way your force is getting reduced so your intention will be that you select such values of parameters which will allow you to get the wave forces as much as absorbed before it hits the uh, cylinders okay so these are some of the graphs so uh, i i know time is already done i guess uh, top on right can i take five more minutes <coughs> yes sir yes, <laughs> because i wanted to discuss too many things maybe anyway so this is a second problem so i had three problems i i don't think i have time to go to the third problem so here what is what you will see is that this is a first region free region then we have a porous structure of different porosity and of different width now when it comes and hits this structure some portion will still propagate hit this structure and go away now suppose you have some kind of installation here you have some kind of installation here then this installation actually the wave force that it will encounter will be very less and of course practical situation will be to consider a porous seabed now you have three regions actually you will have three or uh, four regions so you have four boundary wall problems so i think i had an animation but i don't think i will go there because again i have to uh, stop sharing i have to go to that video it actually shows how wave actually comes and hits the structure and the wave propagates so what will be our uh, objective will be we form the boundary value problems which will be governed by modified helmholtz equation when j is equal to 1 2 3 4 it will be like this and for different uh, j is actually you will have different uh, for different region we will have different boundary value problems then this is an important condition which is satisfied these are the matching conditions uh, along the interfaces which has to be satisfied and this is a two layer fluid i forgot to tell you because ocean water you cannot always consider that it is a homogeneous layer it may be stratified so you at least you can have actually three layers and how uh, we consider the density of layers so that i will not be able to discuss here so this is a bed condition which is satisfied and because the bed is porous the porosity of the bed is taken into account then there are many matching conditions if you see there are vertical interfaces then you have horizontal interfaces then those conditions are to be satisfied then after that finding the expression of velocity potentials you have to equate them or you can actually use the matching conditions which will give you uh, so you see the dispersion relation looks pretty complicated here because we also have a porous region here then this will be a system of equations that you will come across and the system of equations once you solve then you will be able to find what type of forces are acting at the uh, surfaces and depend whether it depends on so you want that reflection should increase increasing you want transmission should reduce it is reducing that means you will be selecting certain values of the friction that will be considered when you consider a porous media or you talk about length width depth etc that will give you certain uh, proper results uh, and many observations are made so i will not go into it and i think i should not so what we do we want to analyze what is the effect of the porosity of the seabed we want to analyze what kind of structure we should consider so that it becomes an effective structure which call as breakwater because our in, uh, objective is to control the wave so that uh, those structures can protect uh, other structures okay so third problem i will not uh, do that is a different problem 
that's what I was telling top one. One and a half hour is needed for me. Uh, yeah, it would have been boring for others, but I could have uh, this. So these are certain of my... Uh, this. So I thank uh, all members, uh, Professor Kannan, Professor Deutsch, and I think Sajad and I know so many others, and especially top one who has been in constant touch with me uh, so that I don't face any problem. He also uh, arranged one trial presentation yesterday, but ultimately I could not even show the animation due to possibility of time. And I thank three of my research scholars. First work was done by Avijit Sarkar, uh, who has graduated, who is working in VIT Bhopal. Ayan Chanda, whose work I could not present, that hard work. Uh, he's doing his PDF in IIT Gandhinagar uh, under uh, Dr. Satyajit Pramani. And the third, second problem that I presented, uh, it's done by Koshik Kanti Borman, uh, who has his synopsis seminar coming up next Wednesday. And all those three works have been published in some very good journals. At the same time, I cannot just thank these two, three research scholars. I have to thank all my graduated research scholars, starting from Dr. Subhas Martha, my first research scholar, who is a faculty in IIT Rupar, to all the research scholars, who are still continuing to work with me. I never say that under me, there is a, under is very difficult and there is no one is under anyone. So which, if you work with, then I think it is more fruitful. If you work under, there'll be some relationship like boss and employee, which I do not want. So I thank all of them. And because of them, I have been able to flourish in some sense. If you think Professor Bora is doing some good research, it is not my contribution at all. I have the minimum contribution. The maximum contribution comes from my research scholars and also the PDFs that I have mentored. Two PDFs they have completed, third one I'm mentoring. So it is due to them, I stand here before you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a nice and uh, you know, fluid introduction to the water waves and to very good problems. <clears throat> So there are some couple of questions. Shall I read for you, sir? I can see the question. The Bermuda Triangle, anyway, I said I'm not qualified. Okay. Yeah. Now, yes. Prakash Kumar. Prakash Kumar. Uh, sir, do you encounter deformable porous structures? If yes. So definitely, uh, see, encountering deformable porous structure means actually porous structures are structure mostly we introduce. Now, what kind of porous structure we are introducing, whether it is deformable or not? Yes, porous structures can be deformable. Now, what you are saying is that, asking is that if yes, then what is the impact of wave propagation compared to rigid structure? See, rigid structure, when you say the impact is very high, but when you have certain kind of porosity in a structure, when the wave impinges on the structure, its potency or its actually uh, intensity gets reduced. So there are two issues of using porous structure. The structure itself may be innocent and we want to design it in such a way that it can stand on its own. Then there is another kind of porous structure which is being used to protect others. So I think these are all engineering applications. So these are some mathematical uh, insight that I have given looking at the kind of structures that is to be constructed, what kind of values that are to be taken for various parameters. Though there is some suggestions from people like us who do research in ocean engineering. So the designers and engineers are the best persons who can actually assign proper values. So that is much, that, that much only I would like to put forward. Yes, Topan. Yeah, so one question in the chat box from Dipin. Uh, <clears throat> so only two only. No, in the chat box, uh, another oh, question. Oh, I saw a question and answer. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, <sighs> Vipin asked me, oh, physical meaning of dynamic, dynamic and kinematic boundary conditions. Okay. So, if you look at the conditions that I uh, talked about, so kinematic, you know, and dynamic also, you know. So, what it means is that we are talking about some kind of uh, dynamics involved there and why we, we are talking about displacement of wave particle we are talking about instantaneous wave motion right so this is what it is at the same time it is actually in motion 
in progressive direction. So if you look, uh, uh, Bipin says something else. No, actually he wants to speak. Uh, ask ah, some see, you can contact me anytime or later on also. Okay. So these are the conditions actually, if you go deeply, so you uh, study some uh, water books. I have not uh, shown you the exact uh, calculations, how we derive them. So it has to do with the vertical displacement as well as the uh, forward motion of the wave. The one, I think uh, Bipin is un, uh, unmuted now. I think he can. Yeah, I, I unmuted him. I, I just asked him to, you know, if he has some any other question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, my doubt is uh, we are using on a numeric. Okay, first thing you say, doubt or query. <laughs> when doubt, you are sir. using English, it has to be very clear. Doubt or query. Doubt, sir. Okay. Uh, we are using uh, a numerical uh, method uh, to solve the problem. So, for a particular uh, some uh, periods, we are getting some oscillations or some resonance we are getting. Mm -hmm. So, why is such a resonance coming? If we wanted to ask solve such a problem, then how to approach that problem? See, I mean, uh, I do not know what physical problem we are considering, but resonance is also a very important part certain things so you may see some kind of spikes uh, even when we do certain problems we see uh, resonance occurring so how resonance occurs so it will depend on what problem you are considering suppose i am talking about a wave interacting with some undulating bottom now the bottom itself may have some kind of uh, frequency as well as the wave may have some frequency now, resonance may occur when both the frequencies actually match. And in that case, what will happen actually? The value will go very high. You know, I mean, resonance, it will, that, that is what is going to happen. No? But I do not know actually what structure you are considering, what kind of fluid you are considering. So it will be difficult for me to uh, say anything more on this at this moment. Actually, uh, I'm using a plate and I'm uh, using some... So, uh, Bipin, what I think will be better is, it seems you are very interested. I also encourage people who show interest. So you are very uh, enormously interested. So it's better that we should uh, contact uh, directly uh, after the lecture. I mean, anytime. You can send yeah, me... Maybe email. you can later. just contact you professor. Now, I can speak for another 10-15 minutes, but that, will, that may not be of interest to the others. Okay. Okay. You are welcome to contact me. Okay. okay so, uh, yeah, uh, another couple of questions yeah, from Amandeep Kaur in uh, uh, Q and A section. Where it is? Question and answer. Uh, Q and A in question and answer section. Amandeep. Okay. So, yeah, it may be possible because, see, I mean, when uh, you are talking about the second problem, right, Amandeep? Okay. So. Now we are considering two, but I we have not done it, but I am sure it can be done for n number of blocks. But when you do the numerical computation, it may be difficult for you if we consider all n. So mathematically, it is possible. I am sure about it. But code, I am not quite sure. I mean, how it, it definitely will be able to develop, but I am not quite sure actually uh, how uh, easy it will be to make the codes when you have n. So it is just like uh, some other problems also. We do the uh, analysis of mathematical component for n. And ultimately, we uh, when we want to do some kind of validation or want to check some result, we'll put n equal to 2 or 3. <clears throat> for example, you have taken two. Ah, so that's what I understand. Actually, uh, I have uh, recently published one, uh, or not recently, last year, with Santu and Sunanda and one of my MSc students. So there, actually, we have considered a different structure, but we have considered P regions. Each region has a different porosity. You can check that paper, or if you want, you can send me an email. I can send you. It is in Marine, uh, Marine Science and Ocean Technology. Last year, we have published it. It is possible. And there, actually, we have done it for all... Uh, P uh, regions, where P is greater than or equal to 2. Okay, Amandip has another question. In the second problem, whether the porous bed instead of the rigid bed affect the force? Yes, it does. 
Uh, that is again, uh, uh, we have a publication out of that, which is probably published in Applied Ocean Research. You can check that. Um, when you consider a rigid bed, what effect you see? Uh, the effect is different when you are using the porosity of the bed because we have used the different uh, bottom boundary condition. Okay. Yeah. Any Amandeep knows me very well. You can always send me an email and whatever papers you want, I can always send it. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, there are no other queries or questions. So <clears throat> I'll take this opportunity to. <clears throat> Thanks our uh, speaker, Professor Bora. First of all, accepting our invitation to speak here. And uh, personally, I like it. And I hope the young audience, the researchers, get the flavor of introduction to the web the what we have theory and different terminologies, why it is important, and what are the different aspects, applications as you for the mathematicians and engineers. So on behalf of Department of Mathematics, I'd like to express my gratitude to Professor Bora and I extend my gratitude to SRM University and ITKM team who did a very, very good job for this uh, arrangement online things. And uh, lastly, I'll extend my gratitude to Professor Karnan, our head of the department for encouraging and give all kind of support. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I thank all of you again. So nice to uh, join SRMAP on uh, Zoom, but I hope uh, I can uh, visit SRMAP sometime. So I have a lot of pending visits now, SRMAP, SRM, IST, VIT, Vellur, or everywhere I am delivering online lectures, uh, but I have, I know all of them through online interaction. I have never met Topon. Topon knows me, I know Topon. Hare Krishna, Veda from SMRS. He knows me well, I know him well, but we have never met. It will be a very so, nice opportunity. If we can I'll take sir, this opportunity to speak a few words from our uh, Professor Kannan. So, like, uh, <coughs> I'm very glad that our uh, distinguished lecture series is going on further and further upwards. Uh, we are reaching further and further heights. And today, Professor Yasun Bora has, has given his lecture in such a way that we who are not working in that area will also be able to appreciate what is happening in that particular field. I was very much impressed and I like this lecture and I'm sure that the 30 plus participants uh, who were listening to these lectures would also have been benefited by this lecture as I have been. Professor Bora said that he, he looks forward to visit us actually in the campus. And now I say that we are looking forward to his formal visit, uh, in you, person sir. visit to the campus also. You are welcome, sir. Thank you so and, much. Uh, I, I thank all the participants for the enthusiasm that they showed in this. I wish with the help, uh, with the help of persons like this, our distinguished lecture series will also grow and become uh, a, a benchmark in our community. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank Professor Kannan because I hold him in very high esteem. So people of our generation, have a lot of respect for people like you who have actually done so much, not only in research, in teaching and in making mathematics a very uh, popular subject. The amount of uh, experience you are carrying with you, and I think University of Hyderabad is still supposed to be one of the best universities in India for mathematics department. It is due to the contribution of people like you, Professor Tendon, etc. So I'm delighted that you have said some kind words about me. I take it to be a very big compliment <clears throat> because uh, though I, I think uh, I have been asked to deliver a lecture, but I still feel I belong to the next generation of people like you. 
And if I get appreciation from people of that generation, I, st I still get motivated and I, I hope I can further go ahead with my research and teaching. Thank you so much, Professor Kandan. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, so bye everybody. And thanks everyone for joining the lecture. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.